Good morning to each and every one of you and thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate your valuable time. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Taryn Holman. I am actually the National Sales Manager for Seamless SMSF and we're an outsourcing solution for accountants and financial planners of their self-managed super funds. We absolutely love being able to support you by helping you create that much needed capacity in your business so you can focus on all the important stuff and continue to grow and thrive no matter what challenging circumstances you're faced with. We also love connecting you with the incredible people in our network, which is why we've put this amazing panel together. And over the next 45 minutes, they'll be sharing as many tips and tricks that time will permit to help you unlock your team's superpower for change. Now, whilst this is a part two webinar, I can see that there's heaps of new people that have registered. So I'll start by introducing these fantastic individuals that make up the panel and tell you a bit about why they are here. Sharon, I will start with you. <laughs> the purposeful and goal-driven strategist. She's a director of Slipstream Coaching and has assisted well over 100 accounting and financial planning firms, helping them to grow their revenue, maximise profit, enhance their lifestyle, and above all, help them run an improved version of their business. With people having to now integrate back into the office, we're looking forward to hearing from Sharon about what leaders can do to make it easier for their teams to slip back into the new norm. Welcome, Sharon, and thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Taryn. Next up, we have my very dear friend, Daniel Tramontana, and besides being the Chief Operating Officer of BGL Corporate Solutions, he's also a qualified mental health first aid officer and trainer, and genuinely loves his community like they are his family. Businesses are made up of people, and to ensure that your team are productive, they need to feel secure, valued, and have a positive mindset, which is why Daniel's expertise is required today. We're going to be picking his brain on how to make sure your team are comfortable with returning back to work and what some of the new obligations are that you need to implement to ensure your team are safe when they return. Thank you very much for joining us, Daniel. It's also great to have you here. Thank you, Taryn. Very much appreciated. Lucky last, we have Lisa Hart. Now, I said it before, I actually believe that Lisa has been studying her whole life to assist people navigate their way through COVID-19. Lisa is the Director of Assistive Change Mindset, and she is a specialist in behaviour change and coaching, helping people to unlock their superpower for change, so they have more time in the day and greater resilience to thrive in a world of constant change and disruption. COVID-19 has been the mother of all instant changes, people, and I am super excited to hear the strategies that Lisa would recommend we implement to get the best results in this unique situation. So welcome to you, Superstar. Thank you. It's great <laughs> to be back with these awesome panellists and um, this time answering some questions from, from our participants. Really excited to be here and excited to uh, unlock some superpower for change. Now, there is some notable background noise coming. Who's the culprit? Someone's just notified me. Thank you. <laughs> is it quiet now? Hopefully it's quiet. Um, now, I'm excited about tapping into the wealth of knowledge that we have in these three guests. And um, we would encourage you guys to ask questions. This time we're going to leave lots of time at the end to answer your questions. So head over to the Q&A section and just type your questions in there and we'll definitely get to them at the end of our chat. So with lockdown laws easing and people slowly integrating back into the workplace, there is another big change on the horizon. And I don't know about you, but it feels like I've just gotten in the groove of this whole work from home thing and bang, we're told that the kids will be heading back to school, which was this morning for all of you Melbourneites and that we'll be slowly heading back into the office. And to be honest, most people I'm speaking to are far more anxious about what their new life will look like post COVID-19, more so than what they were going into the lockdown. So the, the, big, the big question is, how do we support our team during this next transition so they can reach their full potential? Lisa, I'm gonna start with you because this is your jam. 
Uh, what does soup like? What does a superpower for change look like in business, and how would you even know if you have it? Yeah, great question. Um, the superpower for change is really uh, an, on an individual basis. So we've each got gold within us and, um, you know, we firmly believe that everyone's got that ability to lead change really well and to bring their unique way of doing that to the fore and, and their own superpower, just like Batman's got a superpower and Wonder Woman's got her own special superpower. I've got mine. D Trammer's got his. You guys have got yours as well. So... The key is how do you engage people so that they're drawing that out and you're, you know, taking the opportunity to, to get them involved. So firstly, it's really about, um, you know, last time in webinar one, we talked about, um, you know, the, the increased certainty and, and give choices and help people connect. So it's really about asking people into um to bring their ideas to the fore and to really unpack what, what they feel confident about, what they feel really good at. Um, sometimes it can take a little bit of nudging. Sometimes I don't recognise that, um, you know, one of us might not recognise that we've got a particular talent for, you know, being nimble or quickly, quickly coming up with ideas, whereas our colleagues might be able to see that in us and call that out as a superpower. So we generally start with, you know, getting people to talk about what they think their superpowers are. And if they're stuck, you know, there's always people that have got input for that. Um, and that really like a brainstorming session, like where you all just get together, like with the teams and go, right, what do you think you're good at? And then everyone else, what do you think she's good at? Is that yeah, how it's that, or? That's one way that we, um, we, we run it in one of our sessions with clients. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's on an individual basis in a coaching scenario. We do a lot mm -hmm. of that one-on-one -on -one coaching for leaders as well, but, Definitely, you can facilitate that as part of a bigger discussion for a team. And then once everyone knows what each other's strengths are and their superpowers, that's where you get the real collective um, benefit of teamwork because where someone's got a strength and others aren't as good, they can learn from each other, they can support each other, they can share their techniques and, and really do and share that load of that heavy lifting throughout the change. Mm -hmm. Coming back into this you know, whatever this new sort of moving forward is, um, that's when we really need to take that human-centered approach and that's where we add value to our clients is helping them really understand how do you, okay, how do you think about the whole person and the human beings that you've got in your team and take a human-centered approach to bringing them back um, into um, the, the workplace and, and what does that look like? How do, how do you continue that productivity? Yeah, perfect. Actually, Mike McHenry, the principal of Seamless SMSF, he actually gets us to read uh, Who Moved My Cheese. Have you, yeah. any of you read that yeah. book? Yeah. So that's a part of our induction. He actually gets us to read that book. It's a tiny little book. It takes mm. about 20 to 30 minutes to read it. And every single one of us have to put a date, our initials and what character we think we are. And then we sit down and discuss it with him. <laughs> Um, and it's a really simplistic way to identify whether your teammates actually love change and they're nimble and adaptive before they even start by nature or if they will find it more challenging, which obviously then allows people to work with experts like you, Lisa, to help people thrive through the changes because really the only constant in um, life is change. So the sooner that your team learn to embrace it, the better. Uh, Sharon, given there's so much change and uncertainty around returning to the office, what can leaders do to make it easier for their teams? Yeah, so I mean, I guess building on the last discussion that we had, obviously communication, but I actually think thinking about communication not as a one-way train, but ask questions. like. I think um, we can all be guilty of making assumptions around how people are feeling right now and whether they want to return or whether they, you know, we make these assumptions about people and maybe that person likes being at home or whatever it might be. And I just think that's really risky. We actually have to have the conversation. So um, here, the myself and my business partner made a decision in terms, around, in terms of our office. And before I communicated that decision, and we only have a team of 10, so it's you know, I can pick up the phone to 10 people and have a quick conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I said, hey, this is what I think, this is what I think we're going to communicate. Uh, what would be your reaction to that? So rather than go, here's the directive and here's what we think, 
Uh, I actually found out what people thought about that before I sent it. Um, and so I got that feedback and I was able to craft the message so that no one was feeling off because it's pretty serious. So I also think, um, you know, it's lovely to use the words post COVID, but we are not post COVID. So uh, we're, we're talking about in our business, we're talking about the main game. And we talk about that a lot. Uh, so we work with accountants and financial planners. And sometimes you'll have like this $5 million accounting business that are spending all this time on their $400,000 financial planning business. And you go at the expense of getting this thing working and you go, wait, 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 what's the main game? Like let's yeah. short up the main game and then we'll do the, the nice to have stuff. And so our main game is that we don't want any of our team contracting coronavirus. Yeah. That's our main game. And so all of our decisions around uh, travel to and from the office, opening of the office, how we handle team, how we handle our workshops, the very first thing is what is the main game. Uh, and yes, there's some, you know, your brand is at stake, but who gives a toss about your brand when people's lives are at stake? <laughs> Yeah, that's actually, I mean, we've been discussing that at Seamless and it's like we've actually got an obligation because if we come to work, even though a lot of us are young and fit and healthy and we take that home and our grandmother contracts coronavirus and passes away or we give it to one of the kids and they get violently ill, that's a lot of pressure. So I completely agree with your sentiment there. Yeah, and um, I saw that last night someone shared all those pictures of people on ventilators and they're not old. So yes, it's true that other people are at higher risk, but you know everyone is is still at risk here. Yeah, um, yeah I really like the idea of having that two-way conversation before, ideally before you actually send out any company-wide communication if you can. Yeah, um, and you can also like if you've got a bigger business, and I know some of the people on the line today, you know, have forty or fifty team members. Um, it's okay to have a team effort here. So let's group up four people and go all four of us are going to call 10 people and have that conversation regroup. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, I just think uh, make sure you treat everyone like adults and individuals and think I always question how would I want this to play out if I was an employee rather than the business owner? Yeah, that's a great tip. Probably leads us into a good question for you, Daniel. What are the health, um, human health and safety requirements and considerations for your team now that we're integrating back into the office? So just to follow on with what um, both Lisa and Sharon were saying, so one of the things that we did last week, has anyone heard of um, Culture Amp? Culture Amp, was that? Yeah. yeah. No, I've not heard so of it. So it's basically a, a, a right team member engagement software product, right? So what we did is we went out and put out an engagement survey to all our staff and we asked a couple of key questions and I'm quite excited because I can share some of the insights. We wanted to know where engagement was at, right? Because I think engagement is really important because it just gives you a bit of an idea as to how connected people are to the business and what they're doing. Our engagement rate came in at just over 80%, which is about 7% higher than the industry standard in, our business, in, in, in the IT sector, right? We also asked questions around, did you enjoy working from home? Now, interestingly enough, 95% of the people have said yes. Oh, wow. And then, and what's even more fascinating is then we asked, how many days a week would you like to be working from home? And it was between two and three, right? Now, the beauty about that was, we then also asked some other questions like, what are some of the things that you missed? And the number one thing that came up was social interaction all around that incidental communication and the ability to see people face to face. Yeah. Right? Well, we're but humans. Then, we love contact, you know. It's but hard even, to but, get well, but it, even more interesting was the fact that they want a greater say in their job design, right? And what their week looks like. So I think that when it comes to the whole safety aspect, there's some really great resources and stuff like that. And for any of you who are partners or principals of accounting firms or whatever firm you may be in, there's some very good guidelines listed on some of the Australian government websites. And there's some very specific ones around COVID about what your responsibilities are as an officer. Now, at day's end, we all have that responsibility in leadership to make sure that safety is a given, 
it should not be something that your staff have to be questioning whether or not we're taking the right measures, doing the right things. Of course, we need to communicate it, but safety is a given. It's our responsibility, right? So what we're seeing is that people want to come back. They want to know it's safe to come back. They want to know that, that, that they've got everything that they need to keep themselves, their friends and their relatives safe. Right? And it's like Sharon said, it's a very clear communication path and strategy that you need to have to make very clear of what, that's, what, is that, what that is going to look like. But what we thought it may look like based on what we knew in the past, it's not going to be the same going forward insofar as come to the office nine to five, bang, you do your days and, you, and, you, and you're out, you go home, end of day, that's it. People want greater say and want to be involved in the design of what their work week looks like. And, it's, and, I think in it, and from this, what I'm actually seeing is that people are enjoying not having to commute. People are enjoying being able to balance better responsibilities between partners around the kids and picking kids up and all sorts of different things. They've been able to have greater say in what their work-life balance looks like. And at the end of the day, and I think I said this last time, we're actually a part of our organizations and business is going to be that we are going to be much more focused on emotional and physical and personal well-being, and being connected, being commu- in, in great communication and putting things up in, or putting things in place to protect your people is central to everything that we do. Yeah, fantastic. Um, in our office, we have new policies around cleaning. And we are so clean and sterilised in our workplace now, you could probably eat lunch off the floor. And I think it's really important that we need to go to those sort of extremes to keep our team and our community from spreading this hideous disease. So there's so much extra stuff that we've got to do. I think insurance-wise, we need to start doing audits of people's houses to make sure that their um, like workplace and safety is all in order post June so there's all those little things to be really mindful of and it's on top of what we've already got to be doing so I love that you guys are sharing all of this it is fabulous uh, Lisa is there any daily practice that we can incorporate into our lives to help us get excited about things changing instead of dreading it yeah absolutely there's um, you know first and foremost it's it's worth you know on a daily practice acknowledging what's going well you know if we put gratitude at the heart of acknowledging you know each and every day what what is working it kind of takes us um to a to a safer place and just to you know tag on to what um Sharon and and Daniel were saying you know first and foremost we have a duty of care right now to be thinking about our people if we're leaders in organizations and I would hope you know people in teams would be thinking about that about them about each other as well you know really caring for um, each other in a way that we haven't really had to be forced to uh, before and that and that includes the psychological safety and the physical safety and they're the two big factors that we need to be mindful of as leaders moving moving into this. Um, and so, on a daily basis, thinking about and having having a discussion as a team, how are we how are we going? Um, where are we at? Um, checking in with how people are feeling. Are they feeling physically safe about the environment? Are they feeling physically safe about you know that public transport they caught this morning? Do we need to quickly have a conversation about it as a team? Do we need to carpool? You know, all of those things that we talked about as options in the first in the first call um, as a way forward. So I would incorporate as much as you can. Um, you know, just a quick check in. What's going well? Where are we at? Have we, have we got anything that we need to consider at an individual level or a team level around that psychological safety and, and are people feeling safe to come into work? And then the physical safety and those two things are so integrated, you can't separate them out. Um, and, and a key part of psychological safety is actually feeling safe enough to speak up and have the conversation. So you might need to practice for a while and, and set some of those social contracting ground rules that we talked about in the first session as well around, okay, how are we going to do this together? How are we going to navigate this? And everyone, as, as per change, we all know it, everyone goes through that process of change in their own way. So our job as leaders for change is to facilitate each person's individual journey and collectively move people through, through that experience of change, recognising that right now as well, we've got kind of 
change on change on change as we keep, you know, restrictions loosen up. But really that overarching um, issue or, or threat um, as we experienced it a little while ago, it's, it's still there. Until we have a vaccine, we've still got to be really mindful of that. And so I love um, Sharon's main game. You know, I love that focus as a team. You know, this is still real. Um, yes, we might feel excited about going out and going to cafes or going to a restaurant or seeing friends. Ultimately, we still have to do all of the things that, that we've been doing, washing hands, you know, not hugging random strangers, um, you know, oh, all of those things. <laughs> I know, right? I'm totally up, up for that. Um, but, you know, we, we, that's still there. So how do we navigate through this part of the change as we, as we start to find our way and, and you know, Daniel and Ron asking the team is so perfect because they will tell you where they're at. That data will give you really good um, information to make collective decisions on um, and to create that safety both psychologically and, and physically for everyone. Awesome. So communication and consistency helps us thrive through all the change. Sharon, you, um, or one of your specialties, is coaching firms to get them back on track. And um, really, COVID's been such a big disruptor and it could, you know, really derail so many firms. What's the main thing you're focusing on with the firms that you are working with? And how do you get the firms excited to make changes in their business? Because you come and implement a lot of change all at once you know, whether it's COVID or not COVID. So how do you get firms excited to embrace it all? We probably are a little bit uh, different to how people might perceive business coaching. So we're not kind of this, we have a curriculum and you come and follow our bouncing ball and you must do these things in this order. So we meet a firm where they're at, uh, deal with the, the issues of the day. And then once you sort of deal with the, you know, the urgent, going to come off the rails kind of issues, uh, mm -hmm. then we do the higher order priorities. So um, we do we do actually deal with, you know, we're nowhere near as um, the change management business as, as Lisa um, is, but we certainly deal with the, the business change. Um, and it's really beautiful because it's not necessarily a linear thing. I often see like the moment one of the things that I often realise is the moment where people realise their own value. And so we might be working with them for two or three months, but there's this, just this click where they go, oh, actually what we deliver is really valuable. And it's sort of things just, there's just this waterfall of activity once that realisation has happened. And I really like what Lisa said in terms of individuals each have their own superpower for change, but they may not be able to recognise what that is in themselves. Because we meet businesses and we go, wow, you're incredible at this and because we meet so many we can go no 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 this is not normal you do this really really well and yeah. they, they may have they may have no idea and so oh i think my screen <laughs> changed. look that's a bit fun it's I perspective target sheet behind me it's my superpower <laughs> um, yeah so it is about meeting people where they're at i don't think i can be serious while that's actually happening so i might just have to fix that <laughs> oh no it's permanently broken um, technology is amazing when it works, not so good when it fails. I think it's because I'm wearing a blue shirt on a blue background. Okay, I'm just going to show you how it really is. I have a target sheet. In my <laughs> um, this is what I loved about this whole experience. It's very levelling, like it's so real. There's kids running around in the background and there's green sheets and it's all turning pear shaped. <laughs> so it's good. Um, yeah, so we do, we, I mean, it's not something I've considered that we deal with a lot of change because when people engage us, they are looking for change. Like that is kind of the one ingredient. I'm dissatisfied with something that is present. So, you know, I guess what we do is change. Right now we are staying pretty close to the numbers. We always stay really close to the financials. Yeah. Um, and a lot of firms, particularly accounting firms, ran off the rails that we're working with for a month. Uh, and that's not okay. Like it is okay, but... We want to realise that before that month turns into a quarter. Uh, so, yeah, we're staying close to the numbers. Hi, Ron. I know Ron's joined the panel. Ron is He's a surprise Ron. guest. It's Ron Lesh in the Zoom flesh. I love it. <laughs> um, I apologise. I'm late, people. I had a, um, 
another meeting and couldn't get away from it. So. Uh, oh, but you're here now. That's the main thing. I'm here now. I definitely wanted to be here. Oh, fabulous. Um, Daniel, what approach have you guys taken, and especially you as the mental health first aid officer with your team returning back to work to assist with the next big change? Besides that culture and app, is there anything else that you've done? You're on mute, Daniel. Okay. So there's <laughs> a lot of things that we've done. Serious technical difficulties today. <laughs> uh, look, one of the things that we've done is we've stayed very close to the people, right? And we've encouraged all the managers to stay close to the people and just have human to human conversations. Really important, right? Um, the other things that we've done is that we've put a lot of measures in place around what it's going to, not so much what it's going to look like, but to assure people that it is okay to come back together. And that it is okay to be able to be all together in the one space and we can go back to some form of normality. Um, as, as we've said all along, when it comes to change, and, and I really love this model, right? And it's a model that I learnt well, back in 2002 um, when I was doing my MBA. It, it all starts with this thing of break the mould, transition, new beginnings, right? So what it's basically about is, okay, we need to unpack and we need to get to the bottom of what people are thinking and or feeling. Right? And then we need to take them through that journey of and process to get them to the other side of what the new work environment, what the new place is going to look like, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you know, one of the things that's, that's really important, and I know that both Lisa and Sharon both mentioned, is around things of, you know, respecting some of the things in the social distancing, respecting the things around, you know, washing your hands, being more hygienic, cleaning up, because... It, this is just as much about the people that you engage with on a day-to-day -day basis and, not, and it's not all about you. And look, the thing is that it's going to take some time to get people across that line and to, to get them to feel comfortable again. But it's just a thing that you play the long game, you chip away slowly, communicate strongly, show that everything that you're doing is in the best interest of the employee. And when you do that, you see that they'll, they'll embrace the things that you're trying to create. Fantastic. So that framework is from William Bridges, if anyone wants to read more about that, which I will definitely be taking that down those notes and checking that out. Um, Lisa, you run a coaching and in-house capability program where you actually help leaders build the mindset and skills required for change to flow easily through their business which couldn't be more relevant than right now. Can you give us a brief overview of some of the things that you cover in that program? As I think it'd be beneficial for anyone that's tuning in today. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, my business partner, Deb, and I um, are both sort of skilled um, behaviour change specialists and we're also executive coaches and Deb's got a background in HR and PhD in decision making. She's way more uh, educated than me. Ironically, um, but um, so what we do is we start with um, we generally, you know, it depends on the size of, of your team and where what your objectives are. But we generally go through okay, what what how does our brain work in change, and and that can be a webinar or a face to face session. Um, and then we look, we move then. So we start with what is change and what's physiologically happening in, in, our, in our brains during change and then the, and the psychological choices and how mindset matters when we're looking at change and noticing where each of us are at individually and how we respond to different triggers and what our needs are in, in change. And then we look at behaviours and habits and how do we form behaviours and habits? You know, how does that all play out in what we do non-consciously and, and how does that serve us or not serve us? And how do we then support um, our own change of habit and behaviours depending on what our goals are and taking us closer to our values? Um, and how do we encourage others to support us in that? And how do we support others in that team dynamic? Um, and then we look at anticipating change. So the third session is usually around, you know, how do you anticipate change? And, and then the, more about the process of change and communication through change and what different people different needs are at different stages of change and then we sort of bring it all together at the end and sort of do a bit of practice and and look at resilience more broadly and um 
really making sure what we're learning each through each of those sessions is sort of like theory, then put into practice, then test it out and then come back and let's talk about it and really putting together how doctors learn through, you know, they learn theory, but they're in the hospital and they're learning you know, real time. So we really, that's how we, we get people to, to change their um, behaviours long-term sustained way and, and achieve the, the business goals. That's so good. How long does a program like that take? Like, is this an overnight thing? You come in and it's bang, Yeah, it's bang, magic. Bang, it's and just magic. And we're all amazing? Or does it take a while? <laughs> yeah, it's super magic. Um, look, the best way for us to learn as humans is to actually have um, one aspect, which is called space so that is a physiological process where it's better if we sleep in between when we're learning something and and um, when we're putting into practice and adding to that learning so we generally give and we like people to have a go at the content as well so we usually put a week or or two weeks in between sessions but not okay. longer than that because it's too too long so yeah. typically we'd space a program like that out over you know with weekly um, breaks or two weekly breaks as a maximum Okay. But we also do one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. So it's not always about big teamwork. It's, it's sometimes what's a leader need help with? And we do that first consultation free, but then what else after that do they need is, is very much like Sharon's approach um, with Slipstream and, and meeting them where they're at and then shaping it. We don't necessarily force everyone into the same program because it's not always appropriate. Yeah, and it's Taren, so different. Yes. Can I ask you a, a question, Taryn? Oh, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> you might not like this one, right? <laughs> now, when it comes to resilience, right, we, we all know you. We know that you've got a lot of get up and go. You're a very strong person. You're, you're, you've got so many amazing traits, right? How do you... I'll give you an hour to stop. No, no, no okay. I've finished. <laughs> it's over, right? Um, how do you develop your resilience? And what does resilience look like to you, Taryn? Well, my favourite saying is persistence overrides no, what is it? Um, resistance. Persistence overrides resistance. So it's just never saying, like, never giving up, never say die. In a sales role, which I'm obviously the national sales manager, I get more rejection than I get acceptance because of timing. It's not right for people. They're in a bad mood. They don't want to hear from a salesperson. And it's just having the passion of, I've got something that's amazing. It can improve your situation. And I'm just going to keep following people up and continuing until I actually get through to someone. And I think you've just got to learn to not take the rejection personally. You, you know, building resilience is just having really good self-belief, working on your confidence and not taking the, the rejection in life personally. And, and I think that adding to that too, and one of the things that I know that I've, we've discussed internally, it's, it's okay to also not be okay and it's okay to, to be knocked off your feet and it's okay to get alongside that person and get them back on their feet because one of my favourite sayings is that, you know, in this time, just remember that we're passing through, we're not taking residence there. And yeah. there's, always hope, there's always hope for better, right? There's always hope for that bounce back. And I think that a lot of times we focus so much on the negative that there's not enough talk about the positive. And there's, there is positive numbers. It's acknowledging your feelings, but don't stay there. Like you've got the choice. You've got the choice. You can control how you're responding. So it's okay to have those big overwhelming emotions, um, but just let them pass as quick as they came and continue on. Hey, just can I add on, on that resilience piece? Um, We've, uh, we've been working with a professor at Spin Swimmer, Deb and I, and, and we're about to publish a model. So we'll share that with you guys when, when it's ready in the next week or so um, on resilience and taking that more holistic approach to it because it's not just about someone's psychological um, well-being. It's also, you know, the, the digital and the social side of things and, and the environmental aspects that, that feed into how resilient we're feeling and what builds our resilience and what depletes it. So... Um, what I'm hearing from you guys is, is pockets of that as well, which is really, really heartening. And because we're really wanting to advocate for people to, and particularly businesses and leaders of, of people to take a much 
much more holistic approach to resilience and not just think if you if you send someone off on a well-being um, training session for two days that's sweet we've fixed everything when we bring them back into a potentially toxic work environment or a not safe work environment like the whole picture is what we need to be looking at so um, we're happy to share that with you guys when when we're ready to publish that in in a couple of weeks so Oh, that would be amazing. And we will obviously share it with all of you. So I would love to open uh, the floor to anyone that may have a question of our incredible panel. I can see that Helen Malloy, hi Helen from Act Two, uh, is on here and she has noted that it's always uh, really important for the team to see their leaders be vulnerable as well, which I totally agree. It's great when your leader can get up and, you know, just share exactly how they're feeling and say it's okay. Could we throw that one to Ron? Yeah, Ron. Yeah, it's a great idea. He's muted himself. Takes <laughs> up off mute, Ron. No, sure, that's fine. Um, yeah, look, I suppose you've got to be, you, as a leader, you, I think you've got to be seen to be human. Um, and as a human being, at times you're vulnerable as well as you've got to be out there not being vulnerable or appearing not to be vulnerable. Um, most of the leaders I know that everybody sees as extroverts, apart from you, Taryn, uh, are all introverts and, uh, and don't actually like getting out there and, uh, and doing it. And it's, it, I know myself, I'm an introvert. I did my Myers-Briggs test and it came back and told me I was an introvert, um, which, which I knew. Um, so a lot of people like that. It's, I suppose it's a matter of, of being out there, being honest with people and being consistent. One of the things that I find with a lot of leaders and a lot of politicians, a lot of others, is they're just inconsistent. One day they're on about this and one day they're on about that. And uh, something we learned many years ago was if you don't uh, say something seven times, people don't believe you. So as a leader, you've got to be out there. You've got to show yourself to be human. Uh, you've got to react and act, I suppose, in a way that you'd expect a normal person to behave and not to be putting on airs and graces or, or to be um, putting on an image that you're not. And I, I think that's where a lot of leaders fail. Yeah. Now, does anyone yeah, have any questions? Yeah, so I, was just, I just wanted to add to that, right? And okay. I think, Sharon, okay. Sharon, I think you, you got something to add to this too, right? But I think that one of the things that's important as a leader too is just being able to say sorry. It's such a powerful word, yet not many of us can bring ourselves to the position of being able to say sorry. Um, and Ron, I know you don't mind me using this example, but I remember when we went through a period of time which was pretty tough at BGL, and we, you know, we we got a couple of things wrong. And I never forget Ron writing an email to all our clients saying, "Look, you know, your expectation was this, but we delivered this, and we are so sorry for what we've done." please give us a chance to get back on our feet and on the other side, help us to give us a chance to regain your trust. And why it might've seen as a negative that ability to say sorry was just, um, we were so overwhelmed with support that it actually is one of the key things that I believe got us through our hardest of times. Yeah, that's an awesome example. And it's, it's what you, sorry, sorry, it's what you don't see from our politicians and <laughs> business leaders, they never say sorry. I don't know what the word means. <laughs> well, it's actually interesting because in, in the Q&A, um, I, I just saw a comment come through that, um, that one of the attendees actually still recalls that letter and said they're absolutely blown away by it. It's true. Sharon, what's your view, Sharon? Uh, yeah, there wouldn't be anyone in our team who hasn't received a call from me uh, saying, yeah, sorry, I could have done X, Y, Z better yesterday. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I it's it's so important because uh, if you don't acknowledge that, then you're shaping, yeah, you're shaping, I guess, not the best part of you. But I do want to just share something that's happened in our client base recently and um, sort of caused me to ring alarm bells. So, and this may be true for some other accounting and bookkeeping firms out there. So, one of our clients had feedback from one of his clients that they were dissatisfied with it was something stupid. So, it was like, um, I don't know when my cash flow boost is coming through and I don't feel like you've communicated me, with me on the date that and how that's happening. And uh, it was a decent sized client for this accounting business. 
And I guess because of the overwhelm of work and the amount on the to-do list, rather than acknowledge that this single client had had this single experience, the business put out a note to the entire client base and the entire audience saying, sorry, we haven't always communicated over this time the way we'd like to. And we, we feel like we may have let some of you down. And it wasn't true at all. So there can, I've, I follow the communication with about 120 different accounting firms. And I would have said this firm would have been top five daily communications, daily updates, really concise, really clear. And this one client had a gripe and because they were just overwhelmed, the very next day, the communication said, I'm sorry to anyone out there that we've let down. And I was, I you know, picked up the phone, what is going on? Um, yeah, so I just, I, I'm all for saying sorry and being vulnerable and acknowledging mistakes, but don't think that one person's feedback is representative of your whole client base or your whole team. Um, acknowledge that person's feedback. And if you need to apologize for anything, do so. But um, yeah, just just take a big breath before you extrapolate that out and say, well, that's how my business is performing or that's, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this, I, I was so upset because I just thought they'd done such an incredible job over the last two and a half months. And then I get this email saying, sorry for everyone we've let down. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's why they're amazing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really important point about vulnerability because it's, it's almost like the the Goldilocks, you've got to know when, when it's right as a, as a leader, particularly of people and in business. And more often it's, and than not, it's going to be appropriate, but it's how you do it and, and how, how it's broadcasted that, that is the difference. Um, but you can't have change with, with an individual or, or expect change of a group of people without a level of vulnerability because that's where we play in that space of discomfort and that's where we actually learn. And so Brene Brown's got that awesome talk on vulnerability. I'm sure you guys have seen it. Um, it's had the world um, record number of views. And she's got this famous quote, which I often refer to, which is vulnerability is at the heart of creativity, innovation and change. And you, when you think about it, it makes sense. Anything we've ever tried in our life, learning to drive, starting a new job, always, all, always takes a level of risk. It could be having a difficult conversation and getting better at having those conversations. You've got to feel that vulnerability. And what your people need to see from you is you role modeling that because then they'll see that and they'll feel psychologically safe to do that to a, to a degree. It's not like letting it all hang out like the Kardashians do and it's not it's not a risk it's not a weakness either that's that's it's the opposite to be vulnerable takes a lot more courage than it does um to just you know tough tough your way through and think you're doing the right thing so yeah to say I didn't get that right I could have done it better and I'm learning please forgive me I'm human that's much better than just charging on and pretending that it didn't happen yeah we have one of our coaching co clients who who we had this conversation with and um, I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, a coaching conversation with them and they took that away and then they practiced it in one conversation with one of their people. And, and he came back and said, I can't believe the difference, not only in that person's response, but how I felt. I actually felt a lot better. I was nervous going into it, but afterwards it was like, Oh my God, that was so much better than what I was would have rolled out ordinarily and that was just a little piece of vulnerability and some practical skills how to do it that is so good now look if we don't have any questions last week we had a million questions and we couldn't get to any of them <laughs> and this week we've allowed a bit of time and no one's no one's brave enough to put their hand up and ask anything so Look, I am mindful of the time and we obviously better leave it there. I would like to thank each and every one of our panel members today for volunteering your time again. I personally got so much benefit again out of all the gold that you shared. And I hope everyone tuning in this morning got at least one takeaway to implement in your own lives. Now, we're going to be sending an email to everyone that attended today with a copy of the webinar in case you missed anything. And we'll also include our contact details just in case any of you want to reach out directly. We really would love to hear from you. So feel free to give us a call to discuss anything further. And I hope that you all have an amazing day. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Guys.